credit card debt do you have? <laughs> Has anyone ever promised to pay you back for something and then left you high and dry? How much do you have saved for retirement? If the thought of answering these questions make you feel uncomfortable or a little anxious and sick to your stomach, I get it. When it comes to money, we've been told that the right thing is not to talk about it at all. This silence is costly. It robs us of help that's readily available and leads us to choose between our pride or asking for subway fare we can't afford that will get us to a job interview, or between dental work or the karate lessons for our kids. Silence about money and families can separate and isolate instead of uplifting and bringing its members closer. And at work, we assume pay is a level playing field when it's not. All of this sometimes leads people who can least afford things to paying the most. I mean, let's face it. Our financial systems were established for efficient service to comply with rules, regs, and laws, and to deal with the special handling instructions of accounts, not people. The system was never designed with you or me in mind at all. The special handling that you deserve, like frank conversation and emotional support, is left to chance. In fact, one survey by the consumer research group Nonfiction states that 64% of people who have a financial advisor don't feel like they have anyone to talk with about their money. What? Friends even tell me they wouldn't dream of talking with their advisor about their money problems. And it's no wonder. fMRI brain scans show that we feel money strife exactly like a life or death situation. The American Psychological Association says 70% of us are stressed about it. And how telling that even when we have a financial professional to talk with, we still don't. We don't want to risk being judged, rejected, or shamed for how we are with money. Because it feels like how we are with money is how we are, period. But that's not the case. People go to great lengths to avoid having others see the truth of their situation all the time. I know my family did. My family lived large and seemed to have achieved the American dream. The outsiders never knew that we lived rich, poor, rich, poor. Regardless of their hard work and high income, my parents were always within an inch of bouncing checks. Growing up, two opposing realities about money were true at all times and showed up in things like a joyride in a brand new silver Corvette being ruined by knowing we couldn't afford milk or bread. I remember once when I was 10, phoning home in the middle of a sleepover to ask if dad was back yet from Atlantic City. Before the casinos opened in our state, he never stayed out all night. Now that he was, I worried. Was he OK? Was he ever coming home? And maybe most of all, had he finally gambled all of our money away? I had reasons to worry. My mom had let it slip that the bank might foreclose and take our house away. Whether we have a little or a lot, our relationship with money can make us feel like hired help at a yacht club, and I should know. Despite their financial ups and downs, my parents assured me as a kid that they'd pay for college. Mom was tickled pink by the idea that I'd be the first in the family to go. And the father-daughter time touring college campuses together was epic. It meant long car rides, singing along to the radio, and talking about big dreams. Two months later, standing on the dock of our marina next to his new yacht, my father informed me with a sheepish grin and aw shucks, shrug of the shoulders, that he didn't have the money to send me to school. That message conveyed a complete and utter indifference toward me that nearly did me in. On a whim, my parents bought a yacht with my college fund. 
People give more thought to buying a candy bar at the drugstore checkout line than my parents ever did about that yacht. As I stood there, the dreams of the friends I'd make and all the stuff I'd learn imploded. I was alone and on my own. They chose boat candy over my future. My first instinct was not to reach out and talk with anyone about what had happened. It was to survive. I would figure out a way forward and pull myself up by my bootstraps and never speak of this again. And I didn't for a very long time. Breaking up with that resistance and becoming able to talk about those difficult feelings about money for me was like a cross between a hostage negotiation and a 12-step program. It was hard, is my point, because it meant coming to terms with that early shame and betrayal. Those feelings had a huge impact. They froze my parents and our relationship in time and trapped my own growth as a person with it. And to think, all of that trauma and anguish my parents created could have been prevented had they simply told me the truth. They had changed their minds about paying for college. Money silence like this happens all the time. We project a lot of unresolved feelings onto money, like shame and grief, and it takes some real work to let that go. Here's the reality. It's not that talking about money is hard. It's talking about our feelings and all the shame and guilt and early pain that we've tied up with money that is so hard. And yet, talk about money we must. In order to become good with money, we first need to learn how to open our mouths to talk about it with ourselves, next with people who can help us, and ultimately with the people we're co-creating our financial future with. This is doable, I know, because I did it. And it was choosing to speak publicly about my relationship to money and my painful experiences with my parents that broke me down and then broke me wide open. Doing so allowed me to grieve the innocence I lost that day at the marina. It restored my sense of belonging to my family and gave me an overwhelming sense of peace. All that secret, locked-up shame had kept me from. I stopped worrying I might become my parents. I figured out how to talk with my husband about money, and we've eliminated the stigma about it from our family entirely. What it takes to do this are three stages that unlock us from our panic-filled relationship with money. Stage one is learning how to talk to yourself about money in your own mind without being a jerk. This requires becoming curious about what we're afraid of and learning how to calm ourselves down enough to see what's true. We must go in search of our self-talk and be honest about what we hear in order to challenge what comes up, especially if we think that we need to be good at math to be good with money or that asking how much something costs is crass or that we can have love or money, but not both. Stage two is figuring out how to share your problem with other people who can help you. This is a very important intermediate step where you learn to admit that you don't have total control and will need the help of other people's expertise to help you chart a new course. Because sometimes, understanding your opinion of yourself only takes you so far, which is why we also need to talk with trusted advisors for advice or an expert for a missing piece of information or a friend for their shoulder to cry on. The thought of opening ourselves up like this exposes us to a massive internal tug of war between wanting help and relief on the one hand and what feels like the risk of extreme social pain on the other. Working through this tug of war, I promise you, is the hardest part of talking about money. This stage sets us up to step into conversations with the other people who are affected most by our financial choices and whose money decisions also affect us. 
Stage three. This is the big one. When we lean in to have those conversations with people we're co-creating our financial future with, like our family, friends, bosses, or even the person who sells you your car, we're able to speak about our shared money problems objectively and effectively. Before beginning, think through the worst fears you have about what the other person might think of you. Consider how they might react beforehand so that you're prepared. Keep in mind, you've been thinking of this conversation for a while, and it might take them by surprise. Decide what you want to talk about, and speak so that your words land softly on their ears, so that it's clear the money needs fixing, not them. No hitting below the belt, no throwing the kitchen sink in. Keep your ideas to yourself, and brainstorm solutions only after you've heard all of their ideas. Doing all of this allows you to paint the picture of what you want and to begin working together to create the financial future you're both dreaming of. Think of how poised and sure of yourself you'll be negotiating anything from a bounce check to a salary negotiation by asking for help and talking with the people that matter most about it. Imagine what your life would be like if talking about money were easy. It will be, because now you know how to talk about it. Thank you.